Um, we talk about single phase. How do you calculate single phase for liquid flow pressure drop calculations? And that's something I, I guess all of you had from before. So it was not many surprises there. And I wanted to make a note that, well, even when it's not common to have just single phase or just to have liquid, um, there might be some cases where, where either the oil is very viscous or you have just a combination of oil and water. Okay? And for some of these cases, you might still go around and don't use multi-phase flow, but you can use just single phase flow. And it's really, you know, that's something, an area very well known, and uh, it's really simple to do calculations. The only thing that I told you, you have to be careful, is the properties. Okay, the temperature, pressure, and temperature, they change along the pipe. So mainly, the density, we say, changes with pressure, but not the most important part is the viscosity. Because if the temperature drops very much, like in that case of Rubiales, I think the viscosity on in the, uh, ambient temperature is like uh, 3,000 3, centipoise, okay? And in reservoir conditions might be like uh, five centipoise. So it's really a big change in viscosity and that creates a huge pressure drop, okay? <coughs> so I was talking yesterday about water. Um, so, and also keep in mind, I'm going to talk today about multi-phase flow, but the idea really, we are not going to look too much in detail about multi-phase flow. For that you have completely other department, other courses. It's not kind of the main uh, objective of the course to make you experts in multi-phase flow. The thing is that you have to know how do you compute pressure drop and how that's going to affect our calculations for finding equilibrium, okay? And you will see it's, it's, it's very much is quite or Com almost completely different than what you do for a single phase flow. Okay, so we had uh, a discussion last class about water plus oil <coughs> flow. And we said, I think I brought you a picture. Okay, the, all the possible, this is in horizontal pipe, but all the possible flow patterns that you might have in a, of liquid liquid, okay? We might say that the black one is the bad one, is the oil, oil, and the white one, the w good one, is the water. And we can have all kinds of patterns, stratified, we have some bubbles, less bubbles, and when you usually have the thing, when you usually have very separated, these are all of these things we will see a bit later, but they are called flow patterns. In the flow line, yep. Yeah. And uh, and also occurs also in the well, okay. Uh, and this uh, basically is just the configuration how the fluid or the two phases arrange themselves in the pipe. Spatial arrangement or configuration. Okay, while flowing, and we will see later, a bit later, how that comes from. But just I want to make the comment here for water and oil flow, that if you are in any of these patterns, these two, that you have a dispersion. This you have a, f a fine dispersion. That means that you have either droplets of water in oil or either droplets of oil in water. And on top of that, you say that the two of them, they behave almost like a, like a one fluid, okay? They go, they are so mixed that they behave almost like if it was one fluid. So we can say that they go at the same velocity, they share the same uh, velocity field. So you say they behave almost For those cases, is if you all of these conditions apply, okay, and luckily there are many cases in in the field that we have these conditions apply. 
we can use just the single phase equa equation we can use just single phase or a modified version so we have to put here it is possible to use A modified version of the pressure drop for single for liquid, okay, for liquid flow. And how do I do that? First, if you remember the equation, anyone remembers the equation? It was P2 equal to density times gravity gravitational acceleration then you had set uh, 1 min minus set 2 uh, plus P1 over this uh, plus uh, was it something like that? I think so Hmm? Uh, no, diameter. Hmm? Diameter. diameter. Oh, but we are using Q, the velocity. Yeah. It's okay. So it's okay? Yeah, so, what? There, is a minus, um, there should be a minus? Here? Yes. Uh, I think if Z has to be the same sign as P. No, I'm talking about that equation. This one? Yes. But if we are saying that we are flowing from 1 to 2, so the energy in 1 should be greater than the energy in 2 in order to flow. So, yeah, so it's minus here. I think so. Yep, yeah. okay. So we need for this equation we have to use a density we have to use a viscosity and really we don't need many other any other fluid properties right i think mainly we need viscosity and density we need viscosity to calculate the reynolds number that is rho phi velocity divided by uh, viscosity then we need um, to calculate the velocity we need the local rate divided by the area and the local rate we can calculate with for example the mass flow rate divided by the density right <coughs> divided by the area of the pipe so to use this equation we are going to use an equivalent density of the mixture of the mixture of oil 4 now we say 4 oil and water Yes? You said that we can use it in fine dispersion, like in this kind of flow, but how do we identify that whether we have this kind of flow or not? That's a big issue. And for that, we are going to go to multiphase flow. Okay? But basically, if you manage to detect or you do some tests in, labor in the laboratory and you see that you will have all the time a fine dispersion, then you can use this approach. Okay? But usually, you need a way to detect in which flow pattern you have. Okay, depending on your operational conditions. And after that, you decide which calculation method to use. Okay. So the density of the mixture, it's the volume fraction of the oil times the density of the oil plus the volume fraction of the water times the density of the water. Okay, and what do I mean by volume fraction? Volume fraction, this is volume fraction, is the local flow rate of oil divided by the local flow rate of oil plus the flow rate of water. Okay? And you know that alpha oil plus alpha water is equal to 1. So you calculate some kind of 
combine or a mixture, a density of the mixture, an equivalent density of the mixture. And the way how you calculate this density of the mixture is using a weight factor that is going to be the volume fraction. And for that, you need the local flow rates of oil and water. But that's not the only thing that we have to change. Now we have also a, a certain mister. So we have the velocity. We're assuming that both of them go at the same velocity. So how do I calculate the velocity? The velocity of the mixture is equal to the sum of rate of local volume rate of oil plus water divided by the area. Okay, That's how I get the velocity of my mixture. Now there is one big thing that we have to find out what to do with it, and it's the viscosity. But if, if the oil and water are flowing at a single fluid, then the rate should not be the same? No, not, not necessarily. They are flowing almost like a single mixture, but you might have less water than oil. Yeah. But the rates could be different. The rates could be different. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. What you're saying is that it moves like uh, if you have, for example, if you see the flow, you see the droplets, they move the continuous fluid and the droplet, they move exactly at the same speed. Okay. There might be some cases, and we will discuss that just if you give me 10 minutes, we will discuss that. There might be cases where you have actually one moves quicker than the other. Okay, and then this approximation is not very good. You have to do something else. You have to do multi-phase flow calculations. But if you assume that they moved at the same speed, and actually, you know, it might be that there are only three droplets, for example, and you have, let's say here, the water cut is 90%. You have almost water. But the two of them are moving at the same velocity. But if they are moving at the same velocity, why, why the rates are different? Because the... The area that each phase occupies is different. Okay, if you take this case and you put all the oil to the top and all the water to the bottom, okay, you will get something like this. Right. So to calculate the rate of this phase, you have to use the velocity of the mixture times the area that the oil is occupying. Okay, and to calculate the rate of this, you use again the same velocity, but now the area is bigger. It's like each phase is not occupying the whole pipe. It's only occupying and sharing the pipe with another phase. But for this assumption, for using this equation, we have to say that the velocities are the same and the equivalent mixture of density of the mixture can be calculated like this. So what to do with viscosity? So one approach that could be used is you say the viscosity, we use the viscosity, we use the mixture viscosity, And that's not very good approximation. I'm just putting it here because it's mentioned in the textbooks, but it's really not, usually it's not a good approximation. And for that you say the same thing, the same weighting that you were using for the density. One minus uh, yeah, alpha of the oil times viscosity of the oil plus alpha of the water times viscosity of the water. But that's usually not a good approximation. Uh, now there is another option which is to use the viscosity of the continuous fluid of the fluid that is wetting the walls use the viscosity of the fluid okay the continuous fluid So first you have to determine if the fluid is, you have water continuous or oil continuous, and depending on that, you use that, um, that viscosity. Water continuous. So water continuous, if we say that black was the, the oil, it's going to look something like that. So in that case, the viscosity that we will use in our equation will be the viscosity of the water. 
and if we have oil continuous okay then the viscosity that we will use is the viscosity of the oil and this is usually a good approximation when we are in the extremes okay if we have uh, alpha oil is very high or alpha water is very high if we are we have or a lot of oil or if we have a lot of water but if we are something in between let's say as I have 50 50 usually this is not a good approximation and you will see very soon why <coughs> if we um, Yeah, it's still possible, mm -hmm. depending on the velocities. It's a bit difficult to see, but it is still possible if the velocities are high enough, you might have just uh, just droplets, okay, transportation of droplets. Let me see if I can explain, you know, maybe with an experiment. Okay, we have we have a pipe, okay, and we have a pressure gauge at the inlet and we have a pressure gauge at the outlet. And we are circulating certain mixture, initially at a certain velocity. And then we, initially the mixture is 100% alpha oil, okay? So the mixture initially is 100% oil. And I'm going to record the delta P. Okay, or if I okay, want to be a bit more strict, I say delta P, the the pressure gradient. Okay. So I have a, if I have single phase oil, I get this pressure gradient. But then what was what has been observed experimentally is if you have a very fine dispersion, if you have an emulsion, okay, this actually begins to go up. So even though this is oil continuous this area okay you still the visc the the pressure drop is higher when you increase the the volume fraction of the oil until it reaches certain point that for may, for oils typically is between 40 and 60 percent okay, where actually the emulsion changes or the dispersion changes and it changes from oil continuous to water continuous And then it drops dramatically, the pressure drop, until it reaches values. Well, actually here should be alpha water, okay? Because oil continuous means a uh, volume fraction of the water equal to zero. Until it reaches values for single phase water. This is equal to one, actually. Anybody heard of this before? Anybody here? Yeah, you got it in uh, production wells? Yes. Okay. Uh, so actually this is an emulsion behavior, okay? Emulsion behavior. And we have to be very careful because sometimes this peak is not very high, okay? Sometimes it's just maybe, let's say, 1.5 times the pressure drop that you get with a normal, uh, with just single phase oil or single phase water. But sometimes, I think I have a fi figure here. Sometimes it's actually quite high. Like you see here in an example. You see the scale. What they have done here, instead of saying, the graph, gra instead of plotting the delta P or the pressure gradient, they are plotting the viscosity that you need to have, the viscosity of the mixture that you need to have to take to have the same pressure gradient. Okay, so if they do that, you see the change in order of magnitude. The single oil phase maybe here was one, two, three, four centipoise. Okay, but when you have an emulsion, it can reach all the way to 150 centipoise, and that can give you enormous increase in pressure drop. So actually, this one might be going up just incredibly just uh, uh, exponentially okay so the way people cope with that so you have to be uh, you have to be aware of this phenomena and the way they cope with that is they say 
if I want to calculate the viscosity of this mixture and I'm not here and I'm not here but I'm someplace in between I have to use this emulsion viscosity and this emulsion viscosity people measure it just in the lab okay they put different proportions of oil and water and they measure the effective the effective viscosity of the mixture they put another proportion and they measure it and if you see also it changes with temperature okay so why is that of course the, the temperature affects the viscosity of the water and the oil so when you mix them the viscosity of the mixture is also affected okay and the way we we model that is uh, let's see the equations okay there are different models so but for all of them usually you have to have some experimental measurements so you perform experimental measurements And you do it first to see if your crude has an, a tendency to be emulsified in water. Just to check if you will have emulsions. What will be that if it will tend to form dispersions like we, like we showed here. Okay, I think I actually have a, a nicer picture of an emulsion. It's here. Okay. And then after they do that test and actually it has tendency to form, to form emulsions. And actually here we'll, we will be uh, in this range, okay? We have water, oil in water. So actually we will be here. And after they do that, they do the measurements and they use, they tune it to an equation. And the equations, some typical equations used are here. That's actually not a number, but actually here you have a constant for the, uh, this is for the oil. Actually, this is for water, and this is a constant that is for oil. Okay, that's called the Richardson formula. You can use this expression, which was very famous, and people were using that for a long time, Brinkman expression. And if you see here, actually, you cannot tune your results, your equation to your results. Here you can use disease until the equation represents exactly the data that you have measured. While here, you are, it's already fixed, the exponent is fixed, so it's already fixed a certain behavior. So if you don't have anything else, you haven't done your measurements, but you suspect that there might be emulsion formation, you might use the equation of Brinkman. And then you have some more kind of, this alpha, this is the volume fraction of the dispersed phase. Volume fraction of okay and this is the, vis the relative viscosity if we are saying we want to find out the viscosity of the mixture with respect to oil okay then we have one minus the volume fraction of the dispersed phase that will be water alpha water hmm? or if you want to find and that will allow you to predict this part in the emulsion behavior and if you want to predict the other side then you have to say the viscosity of the mixture equal to the viscosity of the water times one minus alpha oil 2.5 okay and that gives you the the behavior for this part of the chart so it's really kind of, uh, if you see, it's, it's relatively simple. We can still use single phase flow equations, but we have to do some, some cosmetics. We have to take care of what happens with the viscosity. And especially for oil and water systems, it's very important to take into account that they might be emulsions because this one, this increase is very dramatic. And you might have transportation due to emulsion, the transportation pressure drop in the line increase dramatically. And then you cannot pump this fluid. Okay. Any questions so far? No? Okay. Now we go actually to multiphase flow. I don't think I had any other pictures to show you. Okay. So now we go to full multiphase flow. And multiphase flow is really the most common, is what occurs 
or most commonly found in production systems. We have simultaneous flow of gas, of oil, and water, okay? Where gas is a vapor phase, oil is a liquid phase, and water is also a liquid phase. And sometimes, really to reduce the complexity, because to work with three phases and see how all of them move at the same time is sometimes a bit challenging. You have too many unknowns that you don't know how to, how to deal with. So sometimes, very fre frequently, they are treated has a single a single phase has a single liquid phase with equivalent properties just the same way that we presented before Okay, for the particular case of oil and water. And so where do we get these two, this, uh, you know, all of these three phases? It might happen that we already in the well, the pressure close to the well is already below the saturation pressure. Okay, so we have actually flow of gas and oil flowing from already from the reservoir is entering into the well in two phases. Or it might happen also that we have a, a undersaturated fluid entering into the well and then later in the well it begins with like the pressure and temperature let me find the okay we can take this drawing okay. so you have the fluid entering in that case is entering undersaturated oil to the well and then as the pressure begins to reduce you have I guess all of you know the phase envelope. All of you have this knowledge from before, okay? The phase envelope, how the pressure and temperature behavior of the mixture, and you have this area inside is the area where you have a mixture. Actually, you have a mixture of vapor and liquid. And outside you have, in this area you have gas, and in this area you have liquid. So assuming that in A you're entering in liquid, all the way when you progress through the tubing that the pressure is reducing and also the temperature is reducing, you will have liberation of the gas that is in the oil and is coming out of solution. And that's where you begin to have multi-phase flow. And uh, yeah, so and it's the same thing. I think I have a picture here. If we have a gas, uh, okay, and depending where you start, Okay, you might have a gas reservoir. So you start actually either here or here. Okay, and then you go and while you progress, you actually cross the envelope. Okay, what we are assuming so far in our calculations is that we are remaining all the time in this area. We never cross, we are kind of neglecting the influence of liquid. But if we are oil, also we might it might cross the bubble point pressure and then we have a mixture of gas and, and liquid. And what is very important and what is very different between uh, multi-phase flow in, in transportation pipes, in flow lines and pipelines, and, and multi-phase flow in wells is that there is actually a huge pressure drop in the tubing, in the wells. And due to this pressure drop, you actually have a lot of flow patterns or a lot of different flow configurations that occur just along the same pipe. And that's what is really unique between wells, multi-phase flow in wells, and multi-phase flow in transportation lines, pipelines and flow lines. So actually, because I think I have some nice pictures here, if you see for an oil well, for an oil well, usually it starts like that you have it might be if you're entering under saturated okay that you just have single liquid then some small droplets of gas some small bubbles of gas come begin to come out of solution so then you have some kind of mixed flow we have a dispersion and then these bubbles they begin to agglomerate and be together and so you have larger clumps of gas 
and then even they might form this structure which are called Taylor bubbles okay these are called Taylor bubbles and then you have they, they begin to coalesce even more and more and you might have see that the gas comes in batches okay just one batch of gas and one batch of liquid and then at the end if that continues maybe at the end the gas occupies because of the pressure the gas expands and then the gas is occupying a very large volume of the tubing and all the liquid is carried in droplets so actually what is this is what is so special about wells that you actually might have a lot of flow patterns and a lot of different flow configurations in the same conduit while this doesn't happen really or doesn't happen much in transportation lines because the pressure drop is not so significant Like that's the case for oil and we can also have the same case for gas. Okay, initially you have single phase and you have some liquid beginning to condensate when you're exactly in this line, some liquid beginning to condensate and then this liquid is carried out in spray, almost like a spray type, a mist type flow. Then they begin to coalesce all of the small uh, droplets and then they form bigger and bigger and then you have at the end the same flux that we showed before and actually this is very typical in gas wells you might have the whole thing from bottom of the tubing up <coughs> and uh, let's see so here we have already so the people the way they have been dealing with that so first is try to ad identify flow patterns okay they try to name depending on the configuration of the fluid is trying to name each flow configuration so you have for example bubble flow is what you have when you have liquid and certain bubbles of gas then you have slug when actually you have these packets or these uh, clumps of uh, gas that are passing and then you have liquid and gas and then you have if the liquid is pushed to the walls and the gas is flowing in the center you have annular flow Again, you have drop annular, mist, etc. Okay. And they are, um, and of course, if you can see here, this is not really, um, sometimes it's very difficult to identify the flow pattern. Okay, sometimes it's very clear that you see from here, you can say, oh, that's clearly a slug flow. But really, sometimes it's difficult to identify, to say exactly what kind of flow pattern is. So the, in the flow pattern identification, is, is not all the time black and white. Okay, it depends also a bit on the observer and what do you see on the on the flow on the on the flow pattern and as i told you before if you want to get well i think i write better with a small zoom with a big zoom so if you want to get more details like i told you we are not going to go in, we are just going to s see the basic terminology for multiphase flow and what we could use when we are using our production system, when we are calculating performance of production systems, if you want to know more details, how you make the calculations, what are the dynamics of this flow, there is one course that is called, uh, that they teach at the energy department, EPT, it's called well, multiphase flow, with Professor Ole Jorgen Nidal. Okay, and the code is TEP4250. So if you want to get more details, you can go to this course. And really one thing is that we have two main, we can classify the multiphase flow in two main, two main categories, classification. We have steady state that means that there is no change with time or you have transient that means that you are actually considering the changes in time 
and these are really two very important separations. But now you think, you know, if you you are tracking, you're taking, for example, this position here. You think that all the time that that point is going to remain the same. It's going to have the same volume fraction. Do you think? If we have this bubble flow that is going up, actually, we might show you just to wake you up some videos. Because I can see you're kind of struggling with... Um, Okay, so that's a vertical, that's water and, and air. So that's how this is going up. So if you ch select the same point, if you're saying steady state, we choose the same point. What is repeat here? Here. Okay. If we take the same point, we see that this volume fraction is not going to remain constant with time. Actually, it's going to change because sometimes a bubble passes, then a bubble passes, a bubble passes. So it that really... So really, multi-phase flow, you can never say that it's completely steady state. It's all the time going to be uh, uh, transient. Uh, so that's this bubble flow. Then you have, I think, this is annular flow, where you have uh, gas flowing in the center, and you have the liquid going in the walls. And you see that actually creates the gas passing next to the liquid. It creates all of this roughness on the liquid interface. Then uh, we have another one, which is uh, slug horizontal flow. This is in transportation lines. You see you have a very nice stratified interface. And then comes a batch of liquid with some bubbles kind of uh, immersing the liquid. And again, you have a batch of gas, then a batch of liquid. So that can happen sometimes in, in transportation lines. Uh, slug, I think here you have one. You can see these bubbles that I told you about. That they have this strange shape. These are called Taylor bubbles. Uh, let's see what else do we have. Stratified, that's very boring. Okay, just uh, flow of gas and, and in this case it's oil, I think. And this is actually one kind of live. In this case, they put a camera in the well, in a gas well, and they're actually recording. You can find a lot of videos of this one on YouTube. They put a camera on a wire, and then they begin to lower it towards the well. And actually, the flow is coming towards to the camera. So you can see that there are some droplets that they're trying to come up through the well. These are liquid droplets or condensate droplets. And you have actually that the gas is flowing on this direction. And I think that they lower it at some point. to some areas where you have more liquid on the walls. Okay, that's I think. Okay, all kind of experiments. Actually here you have kind of a perforation or I don't know. <coughs> Yeah, so let's take, just to wake you up, just take a break now, and we continue with the second part in, let's say, 10 minutes. Okay, we continue. So, there are, uh, so the videos, I think there was nothing else to show you. And really, there is a very big difference, but by steady state, we say that if we take the pipe, Okay? We are not looking exactly in one point because we know that that's going to change. But we are saying an average. If we take a cross-section, the alpha of this cross-section of oil okay, is going to remain the same with time. It's not almost not going to change with time. Okay? It might happen that there might be some different bubbles that is changing, but the average is not changing. Okay? And that's what I refer to steady-state multiphase flow. Okay, and this is almost like two different, two like two divorced, okay, two separate families, okay, because there is a lot of people or there is a bunch of software and people doing computation for steady state multiphase flow. In this case, we have, I guess you have heard some of this software, but we have PipeSim, okay, we have Gap, we have Prosper, 
and we have uh, from Weatherford, it's called Wellflow. Okay. And Transient, we also have here Olga, but Olga and Leda, these are really meant for transient problems. And transient problems, I mean when you actually have a change with time in the volume fraction. One example, very simple, will be accumulation of liquid in a pipe. You have the Snow White case that I told you, actually the pipe is not horizontal, but it has a profile that goes up and down, up and down. Uh, it might happen that you have liquid at the lower part of the, the pipe, and then it begins just to accumulate. And then the volume fraction, exactly at this plane, is going to change with time, it's going to increase. So for that part particular type of problems is that you use Olga or Leda, and I guess there is another simulator that I forgot the name, but uh, yeah, these are the commercial simulators. And these are like two different families. Even though the research that you do in multi-phase flow, you try to, to characterize the flow patterns, you try to characterize the pressure drop, is used for both. They have like two different directions. Okay, and especially these guys that they focus very much on pressure drop in the wells it, because it's very important because you have this particular or a special case that I mentioned before. Yep, no questions? Okay. Now, multi phase flow, usually the way it is done, just to give you kind of a short introduction, we would like to, like, what we have done for single phase flow is we try to create an dimensional number. Okay, we created this friction factor that was equal to a delta P divided by okay. we created this dimensional number and the Reynolds and we tried to find a relationship between them and that's where this is really the Moody diagram and like that we were able to kind of say what's happening with the pressure drop for multi-phase flow, this is extremely complicated to find a dimensional numbers, to find only one set of a dimensional numbers that are going to define completely the behavior of my system. Okay, it's extremely difficult. So we can write that sentence. I think I have it here. That is a dimensional numbers. Okay, where the friction factor is just a relationship re relationship between the pressure drop and the kinetic energy. If you see, this is kind of a kinetic energy, and the Reynolds is just a relationship between kinetic energy or velocity divided by inertia or by uh, uh, viscous forces. Okay, so it's not possible to use it. Why not use the same approach as for single phase flow in multi phase flow? Okay, in reality, you need a large number of a dimensional numbers. To cover all possible pipe configurations S uh, fluid properties flow conditions and it is really you have a lot of dimensional numbers and it's really difficult to why not to say impossible to find uh, a relationship, a correlation between them. So the approach that is used, and now we're going to view Remember that often oil and water, they are treated like a single phase. So we are going to overlook that for a time. Now our main problem now, our main concern is the presence of gas, okay? Because gas and oil or gas and the liquid, they have really different fluid properties. So gas liquid flows. 
And the main approach here is to use some kind of a dimensional number that is not exactly a dimensional, but is sort of a dimensional. That is the superficial velocity of the phases. Anyone here heard about that before? Yeah? Okay. So we use some sort of a dimensional number. Sort. That are the superficial velocities. And superficial velocities is nothing more than superficial velocity USL, that means superficial velocity of the liquid. And we say that this is the rate of the liquid, the flow rate of the liquid. Remember, we are talking all the time about local flow rate divided by the area of the pipe, the cross section area of the pipe. And we have U superficial velocity of gas, which is Q of the gas divided by the cross section area of the pipe. And with these two numbers, really they could the people could do something and at least do some some uh, try to find some relationship. So one of the first thing that was done was to create uh, some kind of a map, okay, a flow pattern map. And for a given, for a given inclination, uh, fluid properties. Uh, what else? Uh, even inclination, fluid properties. What we do is we change the superficial velocities from a minimum value to a maximum value, and we create some kind of a combination matrix between them. we say we want to test exactly this combination this combination this combination according to what I have what I have in the field okay if I have a field for example which has a lot of gas then I want to test with high gas velocities and low liquid but if I have a field that has a lot of liquid and a little bit of gas then I want to try with values that I have a high liquid velocities and low gas velocities okay I want to be in this area if I want a gas field, a gas well, for example, I want to go in this area, for example. Yeah. And they first, the first thing that is done is they ident identify which flow patterns do I have. So I think for that I have a nice drawing. Okay, and you first map it depending on the range that you have. You see where do I have slug flow, bubble flow, churn flow, froth flow, annular flow, and they try to say the boundary or the division between them. And for that, exactly to get these lines, you might imagine that you need a very fine grid because you need to test a lot of combinations. Okay, and yeah, let me just that, and I think I have another map someplace. We have also for horizontal pipes. Okay, that's uh, a horizontal pipe. Also exactly the same thing. Okay. But if you see here, we have done a very important assumption, that is to say that we are doing that for a given inclination. We are also doing that for a given pipe diameter. For a given roughness, wall material, okay? is different sometimes, it might be very different if you do it for plastic or if you do it for steel, it might be uh, completely different concrete. And if you see in this case, they are using the superficial Reynolds number, okay? That is exactly the same thing, but single phase flow, and you use the superficial velocity of the liquid and superficial velocity of the gas. So, in a more general way, the flow, the 
the multi-phase flow pattern and pressure drop is dictated by a balance between the following forces. We have mixing forces okay, that are the same forces that tend to disperse one phase in the other to create bubble flow or to create mist flow, mixing forces. And here we have, for example, we have uh, turbulence. Okay. We have um, also, uh, yeah, we can maybe mixing forces and we have also some segregation forces. And we really have a lot of parameters that pay, play a big role, which are turbulence, we have the inertia that has to do with velocity. Okay. Then we have uh, the gravitational, the effect of the gravity, gravitational acceleration. We have viscosity. We have, for example, surface tension. So we have a lot of things that have to be taken into account. And uh, really what the way or the way this is deal in the industry is by two very distinct methods or, or how do you say ways to compute multiphase flow in production engineering. So one way is to use correlations, and that's really a, was a very popular and famous method until the 90s. People use just correlations, and that means people went and they, for different configuration, they had an experimental setup, and they tried different diameters, they tried different um, uh, fluids, they tried different inclinations, and they were recording for all of them. They were recording pressure drop and hold up, and yeah, we haven't talked about hold up yet. So one approach is to use correlation based. Okay. Equation is an equation based on tuning with experimental data. And that's really the old way, but some many uh, programs still have that option built in. Or the other option is to use mechanistic modeling. Okay. That it refers to doing some kind of equation, applying equations, applying a mass conservation equation, or what we call the continuity equation momentum equation that is balance of forces and energy equation and to put inside of that also some correlation okay because there are some things we cannot exactly put equations for everything we need to have some input because we will have at the end too many unknowns that we have to solve so we have to put some from the experimental measurements, we have to put some correlations. Correlations derived from experiments. And at the end, that's what I solve all of these set of equations at the same time. And that's how I calculate, or that's how I deal with multiphase flow. And that's really the preferred approach uh, nowadays, to go by mechanistic model. But uh, yeah, solve the system of equations and solve OK, 
Yeah, and really the, and this really depends this, uh, which equations I apply, the number of equations that I use depend really on the flow pattern. Okay, why is that? Because for example, if I have, like I told you, you have just a dispersed flow, okay? It might be enough to take just one momentum equation for the whole mixture, okay? We can say all of that behaves almost like a complete mixture, so I use only one momentum equation. But here I have to use two mass conservation equations, one for each phase. While if I have Another case which I showed you before that really we have lo larger clumps of one phase, then maybe in this case I have to use two momentum equations, one for each phase, and two conservation equations. One is, this is mass conservation equation. And two momentum So the model that I'm going to use, the mechanistic model that I'm going to use depends on the flow pattern. And that creates some issues, right? Because I have to find a way to identify the flow pattern to see if for a certain combination of velocities, of fluids, of pipe, of inclination, I have to find a way to identify where am I, if I have a bubble flow, if I have a stratified, if I have a slug flow, and then based on that, apply my equations. So I usually have two steps all the time when I want to do multi-phase flow calculation. One of them is identification of flow patterns and the other part is computation. Hmm? So first is identification. And then the second one is computation using the appropriate model. Okay, yes. So uh, in order to uh, identify the flow pattern, we have to develop those maps that you showed earlier? Mm -hmm. Or you have to find a method to find the lines that separate the flow patterns. Okay? You have to find a way that you can say a, a balance, usually that's done with the force balance, okay? between, for example, stratify and slug flow. You make a force balance between the phases, and then you say when that force balance is break, then I will have, no longer will have stratify, but I will have something else. But so you have to use a stability criteria to define the border lines between the maps. But these lines are specific for It depends, they depend on the fluid properties, they depend on the pipe properties, they depend on the inclination, they depend on many things, okay? So that's why people that are doing, that they are not going this way, okay? The correlation base, they just want to do modeling. They have to find a way to find a flow pattern identification process that will be independent or as independent as possible from measured data. And that involves do some kind of force balance. If you want some more details, you have to go to this course. Here we are giving just a very kind of rough introduction. Okay? But, uh, but basically, for example, for stratify and slug, they put the equations of momentum between the two, and then they do, um, they put the equation, here you have the liquid, and here you have the gas, okay? And then they say, they calculate what is the condition that I have to have for the liquid not to go up and block the pipe, okay? It's a base, if you apply the two equations, basically you can find a condition that where, what is the minimum relationship between the velocities that I have to have to avoid blockage on the pipe? Because when I have blockage, then I jump straight away to slug flow. And that's just a, a, a simple equation. Okay. But like you showed the previous picture in which we have 
superficial velocities. Mm -hmm. So, if you are doing any experiment, how do we control these superficial velocities of these spacecraft? Yeah, that's very that you just change the rate. You use a pump and a compressor. You, for example, in the lab you have, I don't know, you want to do an, a vertical section, so you have a line where you have a tank, okay, with water, and you put a pump, and then you have a compressor, that is if you are using just air, you just have an air inlet, and then you have a mixing point, and then here you have the vertical section, and at the end that goes back to the tank. And here you have a pressure gauge, okay, where you measure the pressure drop, and you actually, the pipe is transparent, so you can see the flow pattern. So you have actually a person <coughs> looking here, and to see which flow pattern do you have. So we will inject both phases different uh, And phase. then you change, depending if you want to have a greater flow rate, then you change the speed of the pump. For example, you increase the speed of the pump. So we will have different pump for each phase, and we will be injecting both phases. Different rates. Mm -hmm. Like what you have in the well. In a well, you might have, for example, it has a very high gas rate with not much liquid, or it might have a very high uh, liquid rate and not much gas. Yeah, of course, this is what it's telling you. This is, remember that this BS is kind of an adimensional number, but really it's telling you is Q of the gas divided by the area of the, the area of the pipe and Q of the liquid divided by the area of the pipe. So if I'm increasing the superficial velocity of gas, that means that I'm increasing the, the amount of gas. Mm -hmm. Yeah, or if you see it in a transportation, if you see it in a well, okay, when the pressure reduces along the well, what's going to happen with the flow rate of gas? If I hear here I had a little bit of gas in bubbles, then when the pressure decreases, what's going to happen later in the in the well? The gas is going to expand, okay, and it's going to occupy more space, and now it's going to be in chunks. And now it will have the velocity, superficial velocity of the gas is going to increase just because the pressure dropped. Okay, so there is one small thing that I have to introduce. I have tried to give you the minimum of multiphase flow, but there is one small concept that I want to tell you before we see the actual way that we do calculations and we go to an exercise, because that's the only way to, to capture it properly. So one of them is the holdup, okay? If we have, if we have uh, two phases, okay? We're again focusing on gas and, and and water, two phases, gas and liquid. If we have that the two phases, they are moving exactly at the same speed, okay? We have that V, let's call it V of the mixture, and V of the mixture, the liquid and the gas, they're moving exactly at the same speed. If I make here a cross section and I see how it looks like, Okay. What will be if I define lambda of the liquid equal to the area occupied by the liquid divided by the total area of the pipe? Okay. And of course, lambda of the this is lambda of the liquid, actually the liquid is here. And lambda of the gas. Okay. How can I calculate these lambdas? from if assuming that the velocities are the same from the rates can i do it you know the rates of each phase okay so i have q liquid and q gas and the velocities are the same the velocities are the same so Okay, so I say that the area, for example, of liquid is equal to Q of the liquid divided by the velocity of the mixture and the area of the gas equal to Q of the gas divided by the velocity of the mixture, right? That seems reasonable. So now I'm going to substitute that in this expression. Lambda of the liquid equal to Q of the liquid divided by and this divided by 
of the liquid is it yeah agree all of you yeah so now I can say I can clear a common factor on all of them and I realize that really the the way the phases distribute if the velocity is the same okay and that means this is some conditions that is homogeneous flow that's what is called homogeneous flow okay the two phases move at the same speed that is not often but sometimes happens then if I want to calculate how they are distributed in the pipe I just say QL divided by QL plus QG just with the flow rates okay and that's a known slip volume fraction Non slip slip means that there is uh, the the phases are going at different velocities, so there is kind of a slip between them. Okay, so this is non slip volume fraction. Okay, now in the in the most general way, the velocities of each phase are not the same. There is actually a slippage between them. the velocities of the liquid is different than the velocity of the gas okay and that tells you and they will have a different configuration if we see the pipe we have a pipe and we have let's say oil here at the bottom moving at a certain speed okay so you have this horizontal pipe what do you think who's going to go quicker the gas or the liquid the gas, the gas okay velocity of the gas. Then what happens if we have this configuration? Who is going to go quicker? The gas or the liquid? Hmm? Yeah, there are many factors, but really we say that the liquid has a higher density, so the gravity is going to pull it down, so the gas is usually going to go quicker than the liquid. But now we have this option that we might have since some transportation pipes what happens here is still the gas going quicker than the liquid in this case the the, gra the gravitational acceleration is helping the liquid to go down but maybe you know they will reach the same velocity maybe one will be greater than the other we don't know but that really the distribution depends on the equilibrium they will be when this one is flowing the gas is flowing it has certain shear between it has certain interface if you isolate only the gas okay the gas will have a shear force that is forcing it to 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 slow down okay it's creating friction it has also the wall friction here it has also some well the gravitation is not the gravitational acceleration is not acting here and all of these forces, all of these mixing and segregating forces, they are playing a role to see what is the final configuration and what is the final volume fraction of this mixture. Okay, what is the final equilibrium distribution of this mixture? Okay, and in that case, we don't call it anymore lambda. Lambda is only when you have no slip. But when you have slip, you call it hold up of liquid. It's actually the area of liquid divided by the total area of the pipe. That's called hold up. Mm -hmm. And that usually if we say about this case, if we are saying that the gas goes quicker than the liquid, how it should be compared to lambda? Let's put a case. If the velocity of the liquid, if the velocity of the, of the gas is greater than the velocity of the liquid, how is the hold up versus lambda liquid? greater okay if we have this case okay in no slip let's say we have that okay now we say the gas is going quicker and it's exactly the same q o and q gas remain the same q liquid and q gas okay the rates the local rates remain the same for these two cases but now if the gas goes quicker 
and it has the same rate, then the area has to be smaller, right? To conserve the 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 local volume rate. Any one of you see that or not? Everyone? Previously you were saying that the velocities are same but flow rates were different. Lambda lambda is calculated with the same velocity of the liquid and the gas. Okay. okay? So you say here Q of the gas is equal to velocity of the mixture times uh, the area of the gas, right? Okay. Now we are saying the liquid moves quicker than the than the liquid. Okay. Yes. They don't move. the The gas moves quicker than the liquid. Than the liquid. Yeah. So these two numbers are exactly the same. Okay. The volume rate of the gas. But this velocity now is higher, is traveling at the higher, at the higher velocity. So in, in consequence, this area prime, it has to be less. Okay? BJ. Making too many mistakes. Okay? This is the area prime of the gas, and this is the area of the gas. Okay? So when you have slip, when the phases are traveling at different speeds, the holdup of the liquid, or if you call it also the holdup or the volume fraction, the non-slip volume fraction of the gas, is going to be different than with this non-slip non case. Okay? So yeah, you're saying that the flow rate in both cases will be the same. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Okay? It's like if you put the same flow rate, QG and Q liquid, entering into a pipe okay and let's say here they have the same speed okay they have the same velocity okay so here we will have lambda that the okay lambda of liquid is equal to q liquid divided by q gas plus q liquid because the velocities are the same now we have the same case, the same rates. We put it in a in a horizontal pipe, in a inclined pipe, QG. And in this case, the the gas is going to flow quicker than the liquid. Okay. In consequence, the area is going to be smaller. So in that case, you will have this situation where the holdup of the liquid is just, you know, the area of the liquid divided by the area of the cross-section of the pipe. And it will be greater than land of the liquid. Now, if you have another case, let me just pull all of that below. Okay, in this case, velocity Velocity of the gas, velocity of the liquid. Velocity of the gas is greater than the velocity of the liquid. Now we have another case where it's going downhill and we are injecting again the same amounts, QG and QL, going downwards, okay? In this case, let's say that the liquid is going quicker than the gas, okay? So in that case, it's going to look like this. And then you have another holdup equal to area of liquid divided by the area of the pipe. And here the holdup of liquid is less than the, than the non-slip uh, volume fraction. Okay? So if we have a bubble flow, so in that case, do we have this holdup? If you have a bubble flow, if there are very small bubbles, they will travel at the same speed. So the hold up, so the hold up will be exactly the same as the non-slip volume fraction. Okay? But if the bubbles begin to be slightly bigger, then the bubbles might go quicker in the pipe and then the hold up is not equal to the non-slip volume fraction. Hmm? Very important concept. When the phases move at a different speed, then you have the partition or the, the, and why it's so important, okay, you say, okay, you have a long discussion now, you have been confusing us a little bit, so why it's so important the way the phases are distributed in the pipe? 
Why do you think that's so important? Pressure drop. Pressure drop, okay. And especially remember that the one big part of pressure drop is gravitational, is due to gravity, to gravitational acceleration. Okay. And this depends really of how the phases are distributed in the pipe. Okay, if you have a lot of liquid, if you are in this case, for example, the hydrostatic pressure drop will be very big. But if you have this case, then the hydrostatic pressure drop will be very small. Okay, it's not the same if you consider these cases. Okay, it's not the same to have this pipe. Okay, to calculate the pressure difference between here and here, than to have this pipe. Because the pressure drop due to the due to the gravity component is much bigger in this case than in this case. So that's why we are so concerned about hold up and about volume fraction and if there is slip and if one phase is moving quicker than the other. Because that's going to dictate the a big very big component of pressure drop which is which is gravitational pressure drop. What about the friction? Pressure drop due to friction and losses. In the second case, will be more. Yeah, we we wait for that. Just want to make first the exercise, and then we talk about how the curve looks like. Okay. Okay. Any questions or confusions so far? What is the slip velocity? The slip velocity is the difference between the gas minus the liquid. Slip. And that's a very important parameter used in the multiphase flow guys. They use this very much. Okay, we are not good. We just want to know that hold up exists, pressure drop exists, superficial velocities exist, but that's where where we want to stop. We just want to use the minimum as possible to calculate pressure drop. But I'm just trying to show you why is that important. Okay. Well, if you have not not necessarily you might have gas liquid flow that you don't have any slip but the thing is that the properties are so different the densities and the viscosities that usually there is all the time slip unless you have bubble flow with very fine bubbles but usually for any other kind of flow pattern stratifies slug flow there is a lot of slip between the phases is there a kind of threshold that defines slip and loss that comes from the multiphase flow dynamics. That comes from the property. For example, if you have a very viscous liquid, that might help to stabilize, to to kind of to break in a way the gas, so it won't go so quick, okay. and you have less slip. It depends on many factors. So we yeah. So clear so far? Okay. So I'm going to tell you now, finally, how to use all of this information, or this rough information to do. <coughs> Multiphase flow pressure drop calculations. On the wool board or the flow line? In conduits, okay? It can be in any place. We can use exactly the same procedure for multiflow pressure drop in conduits. Okay? And that might be used for wells, might be used for pipeline, flow line, whatever you want. So let's put our system. We have our tubing. Okay, and we have to start first someplace so we have q oil and q gas here okay let's say that we have only these two phases so we have to start someplace from a place where the pressure is known okay so we can let's see i propose to start here okay at the flowing bottom hole pressure okay so we start from a point of known pressure and known temperature ok 
okay that means in my case I propose to use the bottom hole okay P so P will be PWF and T will be just very close to reservoir temperature so what is the first step remember multiphase flow pressure drop depends on the local rates okay so we need to calculate local rates so we need to find a way to calculate from here to calculate QO and from here to calculate QG so that's the first step is really calculate local flow rates these are going to be different at each P and T okay they depend on each P and T and I will say in the example that we are going to make we're going to do a compositional approach so I'm going to show you exactly how to do that calculation but basically here we have we can do it with BO tables we can do it with BO correlations or we can do just with an equation of state then the next step is to calculate fluid properties at P and T conditions. Okay. And what do I mean by fluid properties? Typical fluid properties that we need is the density of the oil, the density of the gas, if we have any water, the density of the water. We have the interfacial tension between oil and gas, the interfacial tension between oil and water, and the inter interfacial tension between, um, what are we missing here? Water and gas, okay. Uh, we need also uh, the viscosity of the oil, the viscosity of the gas, the, vis the viscosity of the water. We need also Yeah, we might need many other properties. Also, this one, they come by the same thing, BO table or BO correlation. Or we need also an equation of state. And for that, we need a composition. Local gas, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. The local gas rate, but you can also have like the, all the gas that is coming to the surface is only the solution gas, so at the local gas rate will be zero. For example, yeah. If you manage to say to find that here you will have your single phase liquid, then you don't need the density of the gas. Okay. But we will we will see now compositional. I think it's much easier to see, and then we will go to black oil. How do you do it with black oil? But let's see, let's do it now with composition. Uh, then after that, you have to give the system properties. And that means the, the diameter of the pipe. You have to give the roughness of the pipe. Diameter. Roughness. We have to give not length okay we we are going to use that something else for length we need inclination that we can call theta uh, what else do we have if we have some entry effects okay okay then we go after we have all of that information we go to our multi-phase flow expert Okay, and that multi-phase flow expert might be a software. That means Olga or Leda. Okay, then we go, or we can go to our just correlation. Or we can go actually to a person that they have the equations program and they can give us this pressure drop. Or to uh, our expert. And from here, 
he or that person or that program with all of this information, with the information of one, two, with the information gathered in one, in two, three, and four, okay? The local flow rates, the fluid properties, and the properties of the system, he's going to give me delta P, delta L, okay? Along the direction of the pipe. So why I'm taking away, in a way, I'm taking the, the length away from here and I'm putting here delta P, delta, delta distance, okay? Because the experiments, they are done, I want to try to reduce them to really to a gradient, to see it's kind of in a point, the pressure drop in a point. And why is that? That is very smart because you are not saying this is the pressure drop that you will have in this long pipe section, but this is just, if you have this particular flow pattern you will get this flow gradient this gradient pressure gradient and because it's very convenient for us because in the well we have a lot of pre or flow patterns changing in the well so probably we will have a lot of different pressure gradients along the well okay but just we have to find a way how to integrate it and that's the next step that comes here so what do we do now we have all of that information okay we were sweating a lot and so how do we now find the next point in the tubing. Now we want to find a point here. So how do we find it? Any suggestions? Using to find the pressure. I have the pressure at the bottom of the well and I know that the properties are going to change from one point to another. So I want to do a, disc, a stepwise calculation. So I go and I divide my tubing, for example, in sections. Okay. And now I'm saying I'm from this section and I want to calculate the value here in section, uh, and this is, was one, and I want to calculate the pressure in two. So really, if you see that from the mathematical point of view, we should take a break, it's a differential equation, okay? You have a differential equation where you have dp, dl, okay? You have a function, secret function by our multiphase expert, and you have that P1 equal to, or P0 is equal to PWF and T, yeah, just where the P initial P is given. Do you know how to solve that from, from high school or, uh? You have to use numerical integration, okay? This is solved using numerical integration. Okay, so this is given at X equal to bottom hole and P equal to PWF I have to use numerical integration and there are many methods that I hope you remember we have Euler's method we had Runjekuta what other names do we have? That rings a bell, these names? Yeah? Okay. So if we use Euler's method, that's a very simple, very simple. How, how is Euler's method? Euler's method is saying that P2 is equal to P1 plus delta L multiplied by dP dL evaluated in X in L equal L0 and P equal to P0, okay? Very simple, that's Euler's method. We are solving that differential equation by saying that the, the pressure in the next point is equal to the gradient that I have at my current point. It's actually your shooting, okay? You have this value here in one, and then you're saying you have also the gradient exactly in this point. So how to find point two? I'm just shooting to find point number two. Let's take a break and uh, yeah, and we come back with the example. Okay. Okay. This case that I was mentioning before is like, for example, if you want to construct the wellhead performance relationship. Okay. That is a pressure available at the wellhead. 
versus rate. So in that case, let's say I just choose this rate, okay? I go to my IPR. With my IPR, I get, with the rate, I get the flowing bottom hole pressure. And then I have to calculate the pressure at the, at the wellhead, okay? So for that, I have to use pressure drop in the tubing. So it's like, this is what kind of what we are doing, okay? We are, we want to calculate, compute this curve, okay? So for that first, we have to try a rate. Okay, we have to give this rate, for example. So first we go in the formation, for that we use the IPR. We calculate what is the flowing bottom hole pressure that we have. And then we want to calculate pressure drop in the tubing from the bottom hole all the way to the top. Okay, so that's just to give you, a, you show you why are we doing this procedure uh, with more applied uh, basics. So I told you that to calculate, it's like solving a differential equation by numerical integration. You can solve, use any method, implicit, explicit, whatever you like. Usually what many of the softwares have programmed is Runjekuta fourth explicit. Okay, this is the most common uh, procedure that they have. Uh, but we here in class with the exercise that we are going to make, we're going to use just Euler. Okay, which Euler is just, you're assuming that is going to have a linear, the gradient is going to remain the same in this interval between one and two. So with that you calculate point two in the tubing and then you again repeat the same procedure. Okay, with point, but there is something that we are missing. What are we missing here? We repeat now, instead of departing from point one, which is the flowing bottom hole, now we go from point two. What do we need? Temperature, okay? We have to know also how the temperature reduces in the tubing. And that's kind of a big issue, okay? We're going to assume for our case that the temperature distribution, we, so let's put here for point two, I repeat the steps. But I am missing T2, okay? So T2, where I can get it from, I can say I can assume a temperature distribution okay you assume that the fluid maybe is in equilibrium with the formation and if you have if this is your well and this is the temperature of the formation how it is declining this is temperature versus X, okay, going up. So I can say that the fluid maybe has the same temperature as the formation. If I cannot make that assumption, then I need a model, I need a model that tells me DT versus DL, okay. I need another expert, another multi-phase expert, but this case in temperature, that tell me please what is the temperature gradient. And now I will have a system of equation of DT, DL, DP, DL, with starting conditions T, R, and P, WF, okay? And I can use integration with two equations to calculate the next point. And I can use Euler with two equations, or I can use Runjekuta with two equations, everything, okay? So when you see, and we will see maybe in later classes, that some software, they have advanced temperature calculations or simplified uh, temperature calculations. Simplified, they assume the temperature distribution. Okay, so from here, they want to check the temperature at another uh, depth. So they just go to this distribution and they find what, how much is T2. So it's not an unknown, really. You have a distribution where to find it. But if you say, I want that more advanced calculation, then you have to give an equation, you have to have an equation, a model, to give you delta T versus delta L, and then you have to solve a system of two equations, with Runge-Kutta, with Euler, whatever you want. And it's more demanding, it takes more time. So let's, uh, let's uh, now do the class exercise, I hope you can follow, uh, I think, uh, so the class exercise is exactly what we were discussing now. We have, we want to calculate the wellhead performance relationship, okay? Uh, and we are going to calculate available pressure. We want to calculate 
PWH available for a given rate. Q oil, okay, and Q gas. So for that, someone has already taken care of the IPR. Let's say that our well looks like that. We have the tubing, we have the casing. Here we have PWF and we want to calculate PWH and we already have the rates Q oil and Q gas. Okay. And the temperature is also given. We are using a simplified model and we are saying that the temperature changes linearly from 70 degrees C, that's the reservoir temperature, all the way to 60 degrees C. And it's linear just to take temperature out of my head. I don't want to, to, to deal with it. So if you go to its learning, you will find the Excel files. Uh, one of them has a composition. One of them actually is called uh, pressure drop calculations multiphase flow. <coughs> it's on its learning on the folder of today. And we have, luckily, we're going to use, to get properties, we're going to use HISIS. So this is my composition of the well. Let me put it here. And I have the rate of oil and gas. I have the flowing bottom hole pressure. I have the temperature of the reservoir. I have the inner diameter of the pipe. I have the well through vertical depth, 2500 uh, meter. Uh, I have the temperature of the wellhead, 60 degrees C's, and I have the densities of the oil and the gas. So let's copy that to our exercise. Those of you who want to follow, you are invited to. Okay, so that's the input data. Uh, the input data didn't come. refuses to it's already tired it's you know 6 20, 4, 20 so it wants to go home okay what happened here Why is it refusing? Anybody of you knows? You can save it at the worst case. <coughs> oh no, the keyboard stopped working. Nobody wants to work today. Yeah, just let me get, let's pause for a time, for some time and... Okay, we're back on track. So we have the composition and we have all the data more or less that we need, okay? So let's now, uh, what was the first step? Was to calculate local flow rates, okay? From standard flow rates, the first step was to calculate QO and Q gas. Luckily, we have only two phases, I think, in this example, from Q oil and Q gas. So how do we do that? First we have to know if we have, like you will said, if we have single phase oil or if we have 
two phases if we have gas and oil under this pressure and temperature conditions and luckily we have the composition so we and we have heises so we can try to use heises for that so let's uh, go to farm.ntnu.no and we use here Okay, we go again to scientific, we go to uh, HiSys, okay, and it's going to download this for us, we open it, and I think it's going to ask again for my password. And this actually what I'm doing, I'm running HiSys in a remote server, it's not running on my computer. Have you used Farm before? Yeah? No? You should know it's quite useful. You don't have to install software on your computer, but you can just. Okay, so this is the interface of HiSys. I am going to open a new case. HiSys can do many things, okay? It's basically for modeling, processing plants. But one of the things that it has, it can compute also properties of fluids based on a equation of state calculations. So first components list, uh, on the left you see the tree on the left, that's what we are going to use, that's how we are going to navigate. So first we have to check the components. So I click here add, actually it has nothing initially. And these are all the components that I have. And let's see which ones do I have to add or can you someone maybe dictate what do I have? Nitrogen is the first one nitrogen okay so i say add then the next one is huh? anybody can help me with the table methane is it uh, uh, co2 co2 then methane, methane. Okay, okay here is methane then we have ethane, ethane. What else? Okay. I use it. I use New pentane. I pentane. Zero anyway, so I pentane. I pentane? Yeah. Okay. Makes sense. Heptanes. Okay, it's a long list. Octanes. Two more to go. Okay. No names. Yeah, and here I have my list of components. Hopefully it's the same one that I have in Excel. So I go now to fluid packages on the left. And here is say which equation I want to use to model this, actually these fluids. And really, the equation of state, if you use it just right of the box, might not be fully adequate, okay? Because you might have to do some tuning, but we are going to overlook that part for now. For that, it's better that you go to the course of Professor Whitson. But so we are going to assume that really this equation of state out of the box is good enough for our purpose. Okay, but keep in mind, maybe w sometimes we have to do some tuning. So add, and we are going to work with Peng Robinson. Okay, one of the most famous equation of state. And we assume that this is going to predict very well our, our, um, our situation. Okay, then we don't do anything else and we wrote on this menu on the left, we go right away to simulation. If you see all the rest is checked. So it says it has enough information, basic information to run at least. So now you go to simulation here at the bottom. Okay. And you see you have an empty canvas to build whatever you want. And these people work with a lot of process calculations. So you have a lot of process things here. You have, for example, a reactor, a heater, a separator, a cooler, a 
you have compressor, pump, valve, etc. Okay? We don't want to use any of that for now, we just want to use this arrow that we have here at the top, which is a material stream. This is just, imagine like if it's a container that has some fluid inside. And with this container you can see all the properties that this fluid has. Okay, that's what we want to see really, is to use this very complicated program just to use a, like a property calculator. Okay, so we select that, we put it here, and you see the color is kind of light blue, it's complaining because it doesn't have enough information. So we click here, and the first thing that we want to say, you see here it gives me a message at the bottom says I don't have any composition, so we have already the composition. Someone made either a sampling, someone you know did a, 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 an adjust we have the composition from someplace so the composition we put it here on the left where it says composition and we click edit and we have to put the mole fraction that's why here you have to be very careful I gave mole percent and mole fraction so we copy this and hopefully it works because otherwise to put all of these numbers is going to be a pain something happened oh okay here ah uh, no Okay, why it doesn't fit? Okay, there is one that I didn't have here. Yeah, new contains the one that they skipped. Okay, so we have to take this one away, right? Yeah. So we can copy here, paste here, and we can copy here, and paste here, and then we copy these values, and this should be what I'm going to use, right? So it's a problem if you skip some... And we need to switch between n-contain and i-contain values. They are clipped. Okay. So 0 .0, 0 0.018. And this one was 0 0.005. One eight was it? Like that? Yeah. No. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Okay. Now you see it doesn't add up for something. It doesn't add up to it's needed one, one to the minus four. So I can use normalize, and it's going to change slightly the proportions until I get exactly a sum of one. All the time the composition should give you one. And actually these numbers, if you see that there is a very big mismatch, you have to go back to the person that made the measurements and say, why do you have this mismatch? Why is one value missing? Maybe it was just roundup error. In the table, they didn't put enough decimal points. But you have to check, you have to do quality control and see why that's happening. So after that's done, you see, now it still complains. It say, please give me the temperature. Now I have the composition, now I need the temperature. So the temperature, uh, what was it? 70 degrees C and the pressure 147 bar okay and it needs a flow okay because this container also is saying I'm going to pass through a process separator and then I, sh I use a flow usually when you have a processing plant they have flow but I don't need flow here in this case so I'm just going to put one okay just a number so it won't complain now everything is green everything is happy you know it's it's it has everything that that it needs so let's do something uh, interesting first, is that to look at the face envelope, okay? That was actually one of the things that I showed you, how the face envelope looks like. So let's see how the face envelope looks like for this case. Uh, create, so I go to, on the upper tab, attachments, analysis, create, and here I create envelope, add, and then after I have created the envelope, I can actually view the envelope and see how it looks like and in performance that's the envelope of my fluid 
I'm going to take a snapshot to put it on the notes. If it works, maybe it doesn't work again. This was constructed uh, using the method that we selected. Right? Yeah, using the parent Robinson equation of state. Now, where is the point that I'm analyzing? I'm in 70, okay, so I'm someplace this is 75 so I'm someplace in this line going up okay and my pressure actually how is it 147 so this is 150 so I'm actually either I'm in the saturation or very close to the saturation okay I'm actually very just having the first bubbles of, of uh, gas coming out of solution this is the point 147 bar versus 70 degrees C. Okay. Now, how do I calculate local rates from the standard rates? Anyone has any suggestion? Let's see. Let's see first before that to see if exactly where we are. If we close here and go back to our material stream worksheet, and if you see, I have vapor and liquid phase that means actually that I have is below saturation at that point okay and it was not very very good to see from the drawing but actually here we got that is in the in vapor and liquid so one suggestion that I propose to use maybe you can use something else okay is first we can calculate the mass flow of oil and the mass flow of gas right Let's see how what is the mass flow of oil? The standard flow rate times the density at standard conditions. Do I have these two values? From the data that I gave you in Excel? Yes, I have. Okay. So I can calculate the mass of oil at standard conditions, the mass flow of oil at standard conditions. That will be this rate times uh, this density, okay? But I want to have it, why do I want to have it in kilogram per second? Hmm? Well, the flow rate, I can leave it also in days, but thinking of it, the multiphase expert wants to get a velocity in meters per second, okay? So really I have to get a uh, local rate in meters, cubic meter per second. So I can divide by the area and then I give meters per second. So let's do the change right away. So how do I change from days to seconds? Divided by or multiplied? Hmm? Times 24? Like that? Okay. So 9.8 is the mass flow rate of oil at surface conditions, and the mass flow rate of gas is this number times, remember here I'm saying that's a thousand, so I have to multiply it times a thousand, times the density of the gas at standard conditions, divided by, to put it in seconds again, two point one. So that gives me a total mass flow rate of this plus this 11.9 okay so let's copy these values here so far no surprises I have the standard flow rate of oil standard flow rate of gas and I have also the standard density standard condition density of oil standard condition density of gas and I have just multiplied to find the total mass flow rate that is circulating in the well uh, here Now, how do I calculate, remember that the in the well, the amount of oil and gas doesn't keep constant. Actually, maybe at the beginning you have a lot of oil and then oil begins, the, there begins to be a mass transfer between the oil and the gas along the well bore, right? In this case, if the pressure is dropping, as they are 
oil and gas initially have a lot of oil okay and a little bit of gas but there is mass transfer from the oil to the gas until at the end I have some oil and I have some gas okay so the amounts they change along the tubing but if we take a look very detailed to the data that we have in our HISIS okay for that particular point we see that we have if we go here to properties we see that we have or I hope that I have a phase fraction mass basis okay that tells you what that tells you the mass fraction okay of liquid is 0 0.9975 okay that means that at that pressure and temperature from HISIS at PWF and TR I have initially that's designed by the letter X okay mass fraction of the liquid that's equal to the mass flow rate of the liquid divided by the total mass rate and if we have this value and we have the total mass flow rate then we can calculate how much liquid we have how much oil we have do you agree or not yeah so HISIS has saved our day for now so let's calculate that M of oil at those local conditions is equal to uh, 11.9 times uh, and was a very small value a very big value sorry it was 9975 0 0.9975 how much is that okay and here I have told you liquid mass fraction actually here I can feel that information for the first point uh, 0 0.9975 is it like that yeah, 9975 now the mass rate of oil is equal to this num this number the total mass flow rate times liquid mass fraction and the gas is just equal to this number divided by uh, sorry minus the oil right Okay, that gives me maybe a very small value. Okay, 0 0.03. Now I have to take the density, I need the density of the oil and the density of the gas at that pressure and temperature. Luckily, I can also go to HISIS. It's like a magician, okay? It, I just ask and he gives me. So I have, uh, where is the density? Do you see it someplace? Maybe on conditions? No properties mass density okay of the gas and the oil 115.7 so i'm going to copy that density of the gas okay that should be a point we're working with points and the density of uh, here the density of the oil 569 is a very very light density Okay, now I have the mass flow at that local rate, I have the density at that local at that local condition, so what can I calculate with these two? The local volume flow rate. Okay. And that's nothing else than this number divided by this number. Is that correct? Divided or multiplied? divided okay and here I have the same thing this value divided by this density okay I have a very small gas rate okay a very small and these are the local rates so this is really my what my multi-phase expert is waiting okay these two uh, local rates now I have completed in all the steps that I gave you 
step just step one okay now we go to step two to get all the fluid properties that my multiphase expert needs to calculate pressure gradient uh, let's calculate yeah the superficial velocity what was the superficial velocity the local flow rate of the phase divided by the cross-section area of the pipe right so this is this rate divided by the local area of the pipe and I think I had here the diameter so how do I calculate the area from the diameter pi times the diameter squared times 0 0.25 okay divided by 4 and I can block this one okay so it gives me a oil superficial velocity of 1.84 and gas I think I can just drag it to the right okay and it gave me 0 0.02 I'm almost ready now let's go I give you already in the also in uh, in on his learning a multi-phase expert okay at what I call this multi-phase calculator okay and this is all that you have to provide to this multi-phase calculator and actually it's based on this equation this mechanistic model that I told you about okay it was done by PhD students that were working uh, before and they developed this tool that we can use in class okay? and it's actually quite accurate it it correlates very well with prosper so we need to see what we need we need the viscosity of the oil the viscosity of the gas the surface tension between the oil and the gas the density of the oil the density of the gas the superficial velocity of the liquid or of the oil the superficial velocity of the gas this we should change to oil okay then it needs the angle from the horizontal in this case we are taking just a vertical pipe okay diameter and roughness so let's see if we can find all of that information for this guy to work so uh, let's see superficial velocities they are here so we copy this and we paste it here and we want to paste these values then we copy this number paste these values okay now we need the densities I think the densities we also extracted from Heises densities of the oil densities of the gas okay okay what else do we need uh, we need the angle and this angle should be in radians so I have to say here I have already the conversion I think someone was cheating this is already filled with uh, data from our case so. then uh, the internal diameter of the pipe 0.12 is already introduced here and the roughness uh, I didn't give it here but we can use that roughness that it has so what do I need really I need the surface tension the viscosity of the gas and the viscosity of the oil let's see if we can find that from Heises Uh, let's see viscosity if you see it you scream viscosity centipoise and you have these two values okay so we can copy that's the viscosity of the gas and paste it here and that's in centipoise and we want to have it in Pascal per second so how do we change from centipoise to Pascal per second? Divide by thousand. Divide by thousand, okay. So that was the vapor, right? So is this one divided by a thousand? Okay, we copy that value and paste it here. Then the viscosity of the oil is this 0.298. Okay, 298, and we, again, this is centipoise, so to take it to Pascal times seconds, we have to divide by a thousand. Okay, 
and I copy and I paste this value here and there is one more thing missing what what is it surface tension surface tension here okay and it's just one value because I have just two phases okay you have oil and gas so uh, a is five okay that's in nine per centimeter and I hope that's the same units that I'm using here okay how do I change from dyne centimeter to Newton per meter you have to find these old books of physics that you forgot like five years ago multiply by 0 0.001 okay divided by a thousand okay so you see these things that they teach you in physics that you see you dying I'm not going to see this unit anymore in my life now it came back okay so that's why you have to keep this knowledge in the back of your head all of these years six years so you come here one day in class in multi-phase flow in production so you can use it and so that I'm saying it's important okay or at least you have to know how to google it very quick Just hold on, we are almost ready and we, you can, okay, so we copy that and paste it here. And this is my multi-phase flow expert and it's going to do its magic, <coughs> going to do mechanistic modeling and it's going to tell me, look, this what you have is a bubble flow, which is not surprising for us, okay? We were just below the saturation line, just a little bit of, of gas was coming out of solution. So it's really not surprising that it's bubble flow. And it's telling me, this is going to be the pressure drop that your flow is going to have. Here also nice, if you have time, you can see this flow pattern map, okay? And it's going to tell you exactly, depending on the superficial velocities of gas and liquid, where you have bubble, where you have slug, where you have annular flow, etc. okay? So if you have time, please take a look into, into that. So we have the pressure drop. Let's copy that number finally, okay? From our multi-phase flow expert. We paste it here, and here we have to do a transformation, okay? Because this number was in pascals, pascals per, per meter, and we have to change it to, so to Pascal, from Pascal to bar, yeah, how much is it? Okay. Exactly, and you change the inclination, it's going to change. But why can't we see the For that, we have to ask permission for these guys that were sweating blood and tears for all of his <laughs> PhD to see if we can open and disclose it to you, okay? So we have to ask to these guys that were sweating during his during their PhD. Because actually it takes a lot of work, okay? And if maybe Prosper comes later and they say, you know, these guys, we already have this program, so why to use Prosper? So, okay. We don't want to run anyone out of business here. Okay, so next step was to do actually integration. That's one thing that we have to do and we stop. So how do we calculate the next point in the tubing? And I have done already a discretization. The final, the final point in the tubing is, that's the true vertical depth. I'm at the bottom hole. And then I say I'm going to use a step of 1500, which is quite big, okay? I should use a smaller step because probably the properties will change very much between this point. But this is a classic example. So if I say the step is 1500 meter, how do I calculate the next point, the next pressure? Pressure at 1500 meters is equal to the pressure at 2400 meters minus the gradient delta P delta L at 200 and 1500 meters times the delta L, the delta L is 1500 meters, okay? That gives me uh, 147 bar, I think, minus the delta P that I had, that was 0 0.02 bar per meter, right? Something like this, uh, let's see. 
Okay, times 1500. Sorry. Hmm? How did you get the delta arrow? Delta? Well, we are saying that the tubing has the distance is this distance between these two points is 2500 and we have decided to take increments of 1500, okay? I think Uh, yeah. So we say the first point is fifteen hundred, then the next point is um, thousand, and then the next point is five hundred, and then the next point is zero. Actually, we're using kind of a non-even spacing. Okay, we're using uh, because maybe we are assuming that the pressure drop won't be very much here, but here when more gas is evolving, then we have to use a very fine discretization. So how much that's going to give us? The pressure is equal to the pressure before minus the delta P, okay, the gradient, times the distance. And the distance is this number minus this number, close parenthesis. Okay, should be this one already has a minus. Uh, no, it's the other way around. Oh, okay. Correct. Yep. Okay, sixty-two bar. Now, what do I have to do now? Find the new temperature. I say it's a linear relationship with this P and T. Go to my high seas, find mass fraction, then find local volume rates, then find fluid properties, then go to my multiphase expert, then calculate DPDX, then calculate the next point, and repeat, okay? And I had a very nice uh, class exercise that you were going to do and do a competition, but uh, you know, there is not mo much time. So I hope that you practice at home and you see a lot, but you see it's a lot of effort, okay? And that's only to generate in my curve <coughs> Where is my curve? That's only to generate one point, okay? Then I have to repeat the same for another rate to generate another point. So it's very expensive for multiphase flow to generate each one of these points. is extremely, extremely expensive. And you will see that some people want to avoid having to run this all the time, and they just do use tables. Any of you have worked with reservoir simulator before using tubing tables? No? They try to compound all of these calculations to put it in tables, so they don't have to run every time a cal this kind of calculations to speed up the, the process. Okay, any question? Are you going to practice? Do you promise that you're going to practice at home during the weekend? Or we are going to do a session next, next Monday? We have to solve the exercise during the weekend. Okay, but what do you prefer? You want to just cut it for now, or you want to practice this on Monday? In groups, you want to do, well, we can try to do one hour exactly to, to practice this, okay? Okay, so just to summarize, today I have told you how we do uh, pressure drop calculations for multiphase flow. First, we saw a small section about water and oil flow, that you have to be careful with emulsions, okay? The, the viscosity of the emulsion is, increases very much, usually with the volume fraction, okay, of oil, of water, of water. So we have to be careful with the, with the viscosity of the emulsion. And then we saw multiphase flow, some basic things. We really don't, are, don't want to be um, experts in multiphase flow, but you, we have to know how they are used to calculate available and required pressure curves in, to, in order to be able to find equilibrium. And you saw it's a very cumbersome process, and if we put temperature in the picture, it's going to become even more complicated. And if we want to use compositional models, so we have to go to heises every time, so that becomes very complex. So really, each point, we really want to evaluate and appreciate it because it's, it was done with a lot of effort. Okay, so thank you for today.